I know there are a lot of them out there. It's a virus that's everywhere, almost literally, and a lot of people are afraid of it and also have really interesting misconceptions about it. And so hopefully I can dispel some of that today, but if there are still questions at the end, I think I'll actually have a fair amount of time for you all to bring up some other myths for me. I have nothing to disclose. My objectives really are to make sure you guys can appreciate some key facts around the HPV virus and to importantly dispel any rampant myths that are out there. Um, and finally, I really want you guys to be able to leave here today feeling empowered to talk to anyone you know, your friends, colleagues, patients, students, anybody, about the importance of uh, vaccination for HPV and cervical cancer screening in general. I want you guys to leave here feeling like you can be um, carrying on that word, that important word out into the world. So what is HPV? Papillomaviruses are a uh, family of double-stranded DNA viruses, and they are very species-specific. So HPV is human papillomavirus, meaning that it only infects humans. We don't get pa uh, papillomaviruses from other species, but there are lots of them out there. There are more than 200 types, and I feel like that is growing all the time. We are always discovering more HPV virus genotypes, and some are different than others. So first of all, are they all the same? Well, definitely not. In the United States, 16 and 18, genotypes 16 and 18, account for 66% of all cases of cervical cancer. So they really, really are the heavy hitters and the ones we want to try to avoid. When you include a number of other ones, including 45, which we know more and more about, this um, extra group accounts for an additional 15% of cases, but you get um, that that's up to about uh, I think about 80% now. And so really there's still 20% of cervical cancer cases that are HPV related, but from various HPVs that are not in that small group, that cluster of um, the high yield ones we can fight against. And finally, about 90% of genital warts come from the HPV genotypes 6 and 11. And interestingly, they really do just cause warts and the other ones really do lead to changes that can cause cancer. So they're, while they're in the same family and they're very similar, um, they actually have very different pathologies. And then lots and lots and lots of HPV causes just about nothing. So we're going to spend some time dispelling myths from facts. So number one, only women can get HPV. I hope that's kind of a lame myth that none of you believe, because that just seems really silly. HPV is common among both men and women and gender non-conforming anyone. It is not um, gender specific in any way. About 80% of people will get an HPV infection in their lives. And the take home here is that that is almost all of us. It is everywhere. I often tell my patients it's kind of like the common cold. You walk around the world, you'll get HPV. And so about 14 million Americans, including teenagers, will become infected with HPV each year. And this is the broad HPV in general. There are so many different um, strains that could be included. Now I'm going to try a little tech innovation here. I have my, my dear colleague, Dr. Shah, to thank for a fun little clip I'm going to use to wake you all up. Let's see if I can get to it. Hopefully, the sound works. No! How can I increase? Do you know how to fix the sound? It worked when we trialed it. Yeah. Well, in the event that I can, it's going on loop here. It's like a three second clip. Um, but I will narrate it for you. It's pretty hilarious. It's from a movie called uh, Rough Night, which if you haven't seen it, it's terrible. You probably shouldn't watch it. But this clip right near the end is really, really funny. Basically, this woman sitting on the toilet um, had sex with some guy. And she's sitting here with her friends around her. And she's like, oh, now I'm going to get HPV. And the other girls are like, no, you won't. And then um, Kate McKinnon, is that her name, her character? She's like, if you've had sex since 1991, you've got HPV. <laughs> I don't know why she says 991, but it's pretty funny. Anyway, that basically is true. I would say she's, she's not all that far off base. Sorry you couldn't hear the sound, though. It is funny. So take home here again. HPV is incredibly common. And I like infographics. I'm going to borrow a few from the CDC because I think they have some really great ones. But in general, take home number there is about 80% of us walking around in the world will get HPV in our lives. For many of us, that's many different times. You could get infected with multiple different strains in your lives. It's really, really common. Number two, people with HPV show symptoms. 
Sometimes, if they have warts, but just about everybody else will not. Most people do not know they're infected, never develop symptoms, never know they're infected, and never go on to have health consequences from it. It just comes, your body fights it off like it does other viruses, and it goes away. And that's in about 90% of cases. And we really see, in terms of the timeline it takes, many women's bodies fight off that infection very quickly. But if it doesn't get fought off within about two years, that's when we get a little more worried. Persistent HPV is more likely to start causing trouble than transient HPV. And that two years seems to be a magic number. When HPV does hang around, it can not only lead to genital warts, but as we've discussed, cancer. And the most common one that a lot of us know about is cervical cancer, but we are learning more and more and more about other HPV-related cancers that affect both men and women. Um, for men, specifically, um, penile cancer, and then for both men and women, um, cancers of the anus as well as oropharyngeal cancers. Just for fun, I've got some pictures for you of some warts and some cervical dysplasia. One way that we can look for abnormalities of the cervix on the cervical cancer spectrum, from precancers up to cancer, is by literally putting vinegar on the cervix. And it kind of develops like a picture, and abnormalities turn white, like you see here. It's one of my favorite procedures, and really simple. Myth number three, you must have sexual intercourse to get HPV. Is this true? This is a kind of a tricky one. HPV is spread by intimate skin-to-skin -skin contact. So basically, it's a sexually transmitted infection. But we can't really say that 100%. We do know that while most cases are sexually transmitted, people who haven't had intercourse can become infected. And using condoms can help, but this is really the worst one, because even when people are trying really hard and practicing really safe sex, use, maybe they're pre preventing pregnancy with an IUD, and they're using condoms 100% of the time, they can still get HPV because you can't cover all of your genital skin and it's skin-to-skin -skin transmission. So unfortunately, that's one of the reasons we just don't have a lot of ways of, of stopping the spread of, of HPV. This is one of my favorite myths is that if a patient tells me, oh, now you're telling me I have HPV and I've been in a monogamous relationship, I, my husband must be cheating on me. I really hope women don't have to feel that way much longer. That's a myth I really want to dispel. It really might be that their husband's cheating on them. Sure, they, they have a sexually transmitted infection that may have come from their partner being non-monogamous. But it is definitely possible to be in a monogamous relationship with someone and have an old HPV infection that finally is diagnosed or have skin-to-skin um, -skin transmission somehow where now you have an infection. Um, it's, it's tricky. This is a really hard one to unravel and to describe to women because really it is mostly sexually transmitted, but we don't know everything about it. And so I, I feel like it's, it's not really like other things. Like if someone has chlamydia and she thinks she's in a monogamous relationship, that chlamydia came from somewhere. So someone she had sex with had sex with someone who had chlamydia. HPV is kind of the same way, but I can't say that with certainty. And so I don't want women walking around. You know, again, it's so common. I don't, I really try to enforce for my patients that just because you've been diagnosed with HPV does not necessarily mean someone's being unfaithful to you. But it's just, we just don't, it's kind of a black box still. Yeah. Great question. She's asking if HPV can survive on surfaces. It really has to be direct skin-to-skin -skin transmission. So while it could shed onto a surface, as far as I understand it, we do not think it is um, transmitted by touching a surface that had HPV on it. All right, myth number four. There are treatments for HPV. What do you think? Unfortunately, there are not. There really are not treatments for HPV, which is why we do not screen for it in and of itself, specifically in men. You may have learned a little bit this morning about screening uh, for anything in general. And if we don't have a treatment for something, it is not worth screening for it. Now, we are starting to use HPV as a means of screening for cervical cancer specifically, or cer uh, precursors to cervical cancer. But in and of itself, we actually can't treat HPV. And so we're not screening for the purpose of finding it and treating it. And that's why when people say, why are you finding it for me, but shouldn't I send my partner to go get tested too? And male partners just don't need to be tested because there's nothing we can do for them. There's no treatment for it. But there are ways to treat HPV-related health problems, such as precancerous lesions and genital warts. So just because we can't treat the HPV itself, we can get rid of that 
white abnormality we see with um, putting vinegar on the cervix, and we can get rid of warts. So there are things we can do to treat the pathology that comes from it, but not the virus itself. And then, one of my favorite things, what's better than treatment? Prevention. So we are lucky enough now to have an HPV vaccine. And if we're able to prevent you from ever getting HPV, that's always going to be better than chasing our tails, trying to track it down, and trying to treat the sequela of ultimately getting HPV. So we actually have three different HPV vaccines out there. The first one was a quadrivalent vaccine that was put on the market in 2006. Um, soon after that, in 2009, there was a bivalent covering two different um, geno uh, genotypes. And then in 2014, more recently, the nine-valent vaccine came on the market and kind of replaced the older four-valent vaccine. That's, that one's made by the same company. So what's the difference between all of these guys? Are they all the same? They are all very similar. They do really the same thing, but they're not the same because they cover um, more or fewer strains of HPV. And this is a lot of information. You definitely don't need to um, try and glean too much out of this. But what I am trying to show you here is that the bivalent covers 16 and 18, which, as I explained earlier, are the really heavy hitters. If we can wipe out 16 and 18, we're really going to get a lot of the women who would get cervical cancer. The quadrivalent adds in 6 and 11, which, as we discussed, are the ones that really have to do the most with um, the annoyance of genital warts. And so crossing those ones off the list is nice as well. And then the more recent one, as we learn more about various types that seem to also be associated with different cancers, we're kind of trying to add those into the mix. So now the 9-valent covers not only the 16 and 18, as well as the 6 and 11, but a few others, including 45, which is one of the newer ones we think um, is a pretty pathogenic virus itself. What an excellent, excellent question. Um, so she's asking, in case any of you couldn't, under, couldn't hear, um, if someone already went through the vaccine series with the bivalent or quadrivalent, and now there's the nine valent on the market, should everyone be revaccinated? And the answer right now with the evidence we have is no, because the heavy hitters, again, have already been covered, and you're probably not going to gain all that much by getting additional vaccine. We really don't think there's any harm to it, and so I certainly have had patients who say, I want anything done possible, I want to prevent any cancer I can. There's really no harm to giving additional um, doses of the 9-valent, but as a general routine preventive service, it's not recommended. Um, in terms of the age ranges, I'll get to that in just a moment for the recommendations, but it's the same for all of them. Yeah, very good question. Um, getting to number six, in fact, I think we are coming upon that question right here. HPV vaccines are only for adults or sexually active people? Of course not. For prevention, you need to hit at it before you get exposed to that virus. So really, the target age group is adolescent women and men before they're sexually active. So specifically starting at age um, 11 to 12 and before age 26. That's the age group that it's recommended for. And as I mentioned, it's for all the, the vaccines. Um, they actually recommend even going down to as young as 9 or 10. It's perfectly safe in a little bit younger age group. And they may get a little extra benefit. And I, I would have to double check this, but I believe that if the earlier you are in your life when you get it, you actually can get two vaccines instead of the three. Um, once you're more than 26, it isn't actually dangerous. It's just less likely to be helpful for you because just by function of being a woman walking around the world, you are likely to have been exposed to the, well, not just walking around the world, but having sex in the world. Um, you're likely to have been exposed to some of these viruses, so it's just not going to be as helpful for you. And so in general, insurance stops covering it after age 26. And so really the only people getting the vaccine after age 26 are those willing to pay a hefty amount out of pocket for it. Did you have another question over here? Yeah. Mother to daughter vertical transmission? That is a very good question. I, I think it is. I don't think, um, certainly um, active HPV infection of the pelvis at the time of a delivery could potentially transmit to a, a neonate. Um, it's not something we see very often. I'd have to actually look into that. <laughs> That's a great question. 
So with the HPV vaccine, we know we can prevent cancer. And in fact, 30,000 cases of cancer could be prevented with the HPV vaccine each year if we were using it to its full potential. And that's basically avoiding an entire baseball stadium full of women with cervical cancer. That's pretty crazy. And among uh, women who used this vaccine, we've seen a drop in HPV um, infections with the HPV types covered by the vaccine by 71%. So we really know it's incredibly effective. But despite knowing that it's effective and knowing that it's quite safe, um, only 42% of girls in the recommended age group and 28% of males in the recommended age group have received these recommended doses. And you all might have many reasons you can think of that that might be, I certainly can, but we'll talk about a couple of them. Mm -hmm. um, yes. I'm very proud of you for taking your kids to get them early enough that they did only need two. When they're given at the earliest ages, their immune system, for whatever reason, catches enough of the um, benefit with only two doses. So they actually, the recommendation at, a, at the lower age range is only two doses, and they don't ever need a third. Um, we are learning more about them because, you know, they were just FDA approved starting in 2006. So it may be over many, many, many more years we'll find out we need boosters just like we do for other vaccines. But as of right now, the recommendation is two to three depending on the age range. So why are we not better at vaccinating? It's, it's hard anytime we have a new intervention to get it to become widespread. And just like anything, there's variation across the country in practice style and practice patterns. Um, what this one is showing from the Kaiser Family Foundation is in the more blue colors, you have the lower rates of HPV vaccination, and up towards the orange is higher, up towards about 60%. Um, so you can see New York and, for some reason, North Dakota are doing a really good job. Over here in California, we're about a little higher than average, um, around the 50 to 60% range. But most of the country is not doing very well. And interestingly, this falls out in really interesting patterns. We see a lot of health disparities in public health work, and a lot of the times it's people who are um, racial, ethnic minorities, um, poor women, women of lower socioeconomic status who are not getting the benefits. What is very interesting about this graph is that that is not entirely true. Um, white women have some of the lowest rates of vaccination. Um, Women at or above poverty level also are lower than those below poverty level. Really, really interesting. And I think if, if any of you are aware of kind of the trends around um, resisting vaccination programs, a lot of that happens around very well-educated uh, women who are hearing different things from different sources. We'll kind of leave it at that. Myth number seven would be that HPV vaccines cause dangerous medical problems. Is this true? They can. Any vaccine can cause a very serious adverse reaction, but it's incredibly rare. And actually, any vaccine that we give has a very specific vaccine information sheet that we have to give to patients when they get the vaccine that goes over any adverse reaction they could have. But those reactions are really, really rare. The HPV vaccine is incredibly safe and does not contribute to any serious health issues. And specifically, a lot of you may have heard about the concerns around um, autism and vaccination, and we see absolutely no correlation with the HPV vaccine. Like any vaccine or medicine, the vaccine may cause mild reactions. So some people can have um, kind of syndromic um, symptoms, but those go away quite quickly. And it's, again, really rare to have a very um, sensitive reaction. Number eight, HPV vaccines increase sexual activity. I think this is one of the reasons people really resist giving a medication or a vaccine to a young population for a sexually transmitted disease, right? But we really know that's not true. We know that's not true. It's like um, uh, sex ed. We know it's not true that by teaching people about things and informing them and helping prevent problems in the future, we are not increasing their likelihood of early sexual debut. It is, the vaccination recommended age range is the same for girls and boys. Yes. 
Yes, yep, it's the same efficacy for both groups, thank you. Both men and women have the same effect from it. Um, so there's no research that links HPV vaccine to increase in sexual activity. And boys and girls who get the vaccine don't have sex earlier than those who haven't received the vaccine. Also, they don't have more partners after they become sexually active. There is no epidemiologic correlation there. Number nine, you got the HPV vaccine, so now can you skip your cervical cancer screening? Please don't walk away thinking that. Absolutely not. If there's one thing you walk away remembering, it's that HPV vaccines are awesome, but they do not mean that you don't need to get your cervical cancer screening. And one of the reasons is because we're, times are changing, right? So the cohort of women who are getting vaccinated are not our entire female population. And cervical cancer takes a long time, actually, to develop. And so these young women are hopefully down the road, maybe in 30 years, maybe we'll have a totally different screening algorithm. And the, the nice impact we've had from the protective effect of the vaccine might completely change our screening on its head. But for right now, it is not. It is the same. All women need to be screened for cervical cancer. And I think this is one of the really, really big take homes, is that in a community where we do have very um, prolific cervical cancer screening, it is one of the cancers that is highly preventable, is a really good way to prevent cervical cancer by screening and screening often and, and screening adequately. In countries where they do not have adequate screening or where resources are so limited, Cervical cancer continues to be a major burden of health and mortality for women around the world. In the US, that has gone down dramatically um, by about 50% in the past 30 years, in fact. And so one of the things we're really hoping is that as we advocate more for the use of the HPV vaccine, we hope we don't actually see a rise in cancer just from women thinking they don't need to be screened. So it's really important that you don't equate the two. Stay tuned again, maybe in the year 2080, we'll have a totally different idea of it because cervical cancer will be so rare because the vaccine is so widespread. But until you get that memo, please keep coming to your doctor for cervical cancer screening. Um, I think another important take home here is that just like any health condition, uh, cervical cancer really is one of those that does show that health disparity breakdown. So it is more common to develop cervical cancer if you are a black woman in America or a Hispanic woman in America and the mortality follows as well. So um, again, we need to be reaching all of our populations, everybody out there for adequate screening. Preventing cancer is better than treating it, and that is the main thought that I wanna end on for you guys today.